Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for joining United Way's digital engagement series and happy 614 day. My name is Michael Wilkos and I'm senior vice president of community impact at United Way of Central Ohio. I get to talk to you today about my adopted hometown of Columbus. It's a city that I love and it's a city that has changed uh, pretty dramatically in the 30 years since I've moved here to be an Ohio State University student. And while I'm gonna stay away from some of the stereotypical Columbus history facts, I've put together a collection of both people, events and architecture and buildings that I think have defined our city. I love this kind of fictitious 150th anniversary celebration of the Columbus Dispatch that shows white settlers coming across the Levesque Tower. Uh, but one of the interesting things about Columbus is there's really not a lot that people know about our history. And I'll start with this really dark comedy called The Applegates in 1990. Starred Stockard Channing and Ed Begley Jr. And it was about a family of Amazon insects that wanted to dismantle American global warming behaviors. They took a human form and they wanted to be the most undetectable, stereotypical American family. And so they wanted to find the most average place in America. And in the beginning of the movie, when Ed Begley Jr. becomes his human form, he gets the US census data. And he finds that the most stereotypical place in all of the United States is Columbus, Ohio. That there are no interesting discernible facts about Columbus. It is the most average place in America. And the movie takes place in a fictitious town called Median, Ohio. And that's really been our claim to fame, right? Is that if a product or a restaurant or a service can sell in Columbus, then it will sell anywhere. Well, one of the things about Columbus is we were in fact the first city in the nation to be created solely to be a state capital. Frequent flooding ruled out Franklinton, but Lucas Sullivan, Franklinton's founder and largest landowner in Ohio, offered a large parcel of land on the east bank of the Scioto River when Columbus was born. Unfortunately for Columbus's earlier creators, the first sale of lots happened the day of the war of 1812, making for a less than ideal buyer's market. And there were just 18 original buyers for Columbus. There was certainly no land rush to come to the new state capital. But the design that was selected for Columbus was said to reflect an openness in the start of community building. If nothing else, Columbus was to be orderly. And Columbus has been one of the most consistently growing cities in the United States. It doesn't matter global or national economic circumstances, Columbus grows with a relatively modest rate, no matter what. And with just 31,000 people in 1870, Columbus was off to a pretty slow start. But the city used annexation to capture land and growth and prosperity and by 1928, the city was up to 280,000 people. Significant annexation in the post-World War II era. By 1957, Columbus was still just the third largest city in Ohio with 470,000 people, ranking behind Cincinnati and Cleveland, but that was rapidly about to change. By 1970, Columbus had passed Cincinnati to become the second largest city in the state now with 540,000 people. And today, Columbus is the largest city in the state with approximately 900,000 people and over 220 square miles. It is now stretching into three counties and the 14th largest US city. Uh, it's the highest rank we have actually ever had as a, one of America's largest cities. But how did we get our name? We certainly know that we're named after Christopher Columbus, and for decades, people have wrestled with this honor, culminating in the removal of two of our three sculptures named for Christopher Columbus in the past year. But it was actually a state senator from Franklinton that suggested the name Columbus, mainly because of his love of reading children's books about the explorer. However, the name Columbus was first rejected by the Ohio House of Representatives. It passed a second time 
not because people really warmed up to the idea of Columbus, but actually because a lot of the people who didn't like the name didn't show up the day of the vote. And hence, Columbus got the name Columbus. But for early Columbus settlers, they really tried to re uh, remove the remnants of Native American mounds similar to this one, which still existed throughout Columbus when we were founded. Hence how Mound Street actually got its name because there were a number of Native American mounds in the area. But in the early eyes of leaders, Columbus had to move past these pioneer days toward a more commercial future in order to be taken seriously. So not only were these mounds removed, but the remnants were unfortunately lost as there was little appreciation for who lived here before white settlers. What was on the mind of settlers was getting recognized as a new capital city, meaning let's get a state house built. The new capital structure was small, it lacked a lobby and was unsuitable for silence, deliberation or even convenience. It was reported that some of the bricks made for the first state house included human bones excavated from those Native American mounds found just a few blocks south. The budget for these three buildings was $50,000. However, it actually cost 90,000 and we had the first example of a public works project with massive cost overruns. The new capital of Columbus was not living up to its hype. Columbus was threatened with losing its capital uh, distinction in the 1820s as other towns began to lobby the Ohio legislature to move the capital for a fourth time. The arguments against Columbus included we had poor roads, high prices, and a shortage of hotel rooms. But fortunately for Columbus, there was a national foreclosure crisis happening, which quickly changed the talk of moving the state capital to a far more serious concern. But our lack of identity and inferiority to other communities was already established right out of the gate. We were in, felt inferior to much larger towns, such as Dublin, which actually tried to steal the state capital and put itself on the map. Chillicothe had also held the title and wanted to become the state capital once more. And some legis legislators preferred Delaware as the capital for the state. And Zanesville, which most recently had been the capital, was positioning to take the designation back. Clearly, Columbus prevailed, but from our earliest days, Columbus really had an image problem and it had an inferiority complex. But Columbus needed to worry about raising revenue and that meant taxes. But what to tax? Alcohol was a popular sin tax at the time, but Columbus leaders decided they ought not to since taverns were popular with both the locals and travelers and they didn't really wanna drive business away. So they thought about a property tax but Columbus only had 300 residents and they were desperate to attract more people. And so this also proved to be an unwelcome tax. What about a toll? Well, the Broad Street Bridge, which was a covered bridge, wasn't owned by the town. It was owned by land speculator, Lucas Sullivan. So what was the first tax ever levied by Columbus Council? Well, if you'd like to guess, it was actually a 50 cent tax on the ownership of a dog man's best friend. It was a 50 cent tax on dog ownership and the theme of animals you'll see actually runs throughout Columbus's history. Here's an 1898 picture of a circus parade marching on High Street that illustrates our love of animals. As early as 1819, Columbus was known as a city that loved animals and any animal touring show made sure to stop. Residents actually paid a quarter in 1819 to see just one elephant, the only known elephant to be in the United States at the time. Well, should it be any surprise that Columbus still has one of the country's most nationally recognized zoos given this long running love affair with animals. Speaking of the Union Station, it was in the background of that picture. It was the third Union Station of three train stations that sat on North High Street. Union Station was representative of what was called high style architecture of the city beautiful movement. And it was designed as a gateway building from the north into downtown. It was designed by famous architect, Daniel Burnham, who advocated for beautiful cities and great buildings. Quote, make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's bloods. Make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood. 
and probably will not themselves be realized. However, by the 1970s, the love of old buildings had fallen out of favor and people were no longer motivated by his vision. Union Station was unfortunately demolished in 1976 to make way for a new convention center. Although it had been placed on the National Register of Historic Places two years prior, demolition actually started after five o'clock on a Friday. And by the time the courts opened Monday morning to stop the demolition, only a single arch was left standing, now moved to the Arena District. 40 years later, the High Street Cap was built over 670, honoring this building with several shops that now connect downtown to the short north. We loved parades and festivals and animals so much, Lazarus Department Store was always creating storefront models to depict such events, including this one of a parade marching down High Street. Again, should it be a surprise that in recent studies where Columbus has compared itself to peer cities, the only area where we ranked number one was the number of festivals and community celebrations. We have loved festivals for such a long time and hopefully we will get back to them soon. But celebrations might have added to civic pride. They didn't actually help to pay the municipal bills. And in 1818, the city of Columbus was faced with its first budget shortfall. Uh, that dog tax wasn't actually bringing in what they had hoped. So Columbus leaders came up with a very creative way to make ends meet. They actually printed $555.75 in small bills at City Hall in 1818 to balance the budget. I doubt that our city government is still using these tactics in order for us to get our AAA bond rating. And while this number may seem quite small, adjusted for inflation and population growth of our city, it would be the same thing as if the current Columbus City Council would print $9.3 million in the basement of City Hall. But it really does raise the issue of how did our city come together during times of need? And the first recorded community philanthropy was in 1813, when nearly 300 residents pulled together to raise money to address what they thought was the most serious issue facing Columbus. And that was tree stumps. In fact, they were everywhere. The citizens of Columbus scraped together $200 to remove the stumps from the middle of High Street and philanthropy in Columbus was born. One local was quoted at the time as saying, Columbus had the appearance of having emerged directly out of a forest, given that the roads were being built and too often the stumps were left intact. But it was really the canals, not roads, that brought Columbus early success. As the city grew around commerce from the canals, it needed to be governed. And the city charter at the time said once the population of Columbus hit 700 people, we could have a city council. At that time, it was a city council of nine. Now we are a city of 900,000 people and a city council with just seven. No wonder there have been efforts to expand the number of people on city council because we've went from a city council that represented 128 people to a current city council that represents 128,000 people each. But speaking of a forest in the city, there was a place where trees were luckily kept intact. A young Lincoln Goodale began reading books about medicine at age 10. At 24, he moved to Franklinton, and in those days, doctors didn't do so well financially, but he opened Columbus's first pharmacy and prospered mightily. Even so, he'd never become so rich, but for his faith in the future of Columbus due to all the land that he purchased. And in 1851, out of gratitude to the city, he dedicated, quote, 40 acres adjacent to the city's northern boundary, untouched by ax or plow, and hence Columbus got its first public park, Goodale Park. I think Mr. Goodale would be proud that the city's first park is still so beautifully maintained and still one of the most popular public spaces in our city. 130 years after he dedicated that land, Mr. Goodale still gets in on the action as his bust wears the themed tie-dye t-shirt of Comfest, which represents openness, diversity, and inclusion that Columbus continues to be known for. Event organizers give Mr. Goodale this t-shirt every year during Comfest to thank him for his gift. 
But Goodale Park has been used for more than just recreational green space it, and site of festivals. It was actually also converted into Camp Jackson, a Civil War training camp for Union volunteers. In 1801, Mr. Goodale, who had dedicated the land to be used as a park, was not amused by the use of the park for this purpose. And two months later, Camp Chase was opened four miles to the west of downtown Columbus. Then this theme of welcoming newcomers really stretches all the way back to 1888, when 250,000 Civil War veterans descended on Columbus at the Grand Army of the Republic Convention. At the time, the population of Columbus was just 80,000 people. So imagine to suddenly have to house and feed over three times the total population of the city for a few weeks. Today, it would be like having 3 million people descend upon Columbus for a two week stay. But city leaders really wanted to make an impression to welcome these visitors and they built arches over the streets to show our hospitality. When the Civil War vets left town, the citizens were convinced that the lighted arches could stay and Columbus soon became known as Arch City. They are a symbol of welcoming newcomers. And since then, Columbus continues to be known as a city that welcomes diversity, color, religion, ethnicity, sexual orientation. Columbus has been a place where people have often felt included relative to other nearby Midwestern communities. Today, the arches are no longer built of wood and powered by gas, but they welcome locals and visitors and conventioneers just like they did more than 130 years ago. But what's particularly interesting about where the arches are now, they were not originally located on High Street in the short north. They were on a variety of different streets in downtown Columbus. But it was really this portion of High Street that was predicted nearly a century ago to be a wonderful place of possibilities. In the 1920s, local cartoonist Billy Ireland predicted the short Norse future in this dispatch cartoon, claiming that the area of High Street could become a village of shops, studios, coffee houses, and tea rooms run by a local colony of artists. A wonderful place of possibilities, he claims. He further predicted it could become the most interesting spot in the city. How right he was even 100 years ago. But you see, Columbus was still lacking from that inferiority complex, that same inferiority complex that began the year we were founded. And part of that was the image that we had of our city. Here is the Scioto River between Broad and Town Streets at the turn of the last century. Like every other city, Columbus turned its back on the river. It was a place of industrial waste and sewage, and those who lived along its edge suffered from these conditions and also unpredictable flooding. But it was also Billy Ireland that took on the issue of the lack of quality along the riverfront. And in 1920, he encouraged voters to support the construction of what was to be called Victory Park so that we can leave a favorable impression of our city upon the thousands of strangers who traveled the national road. It is more than worthwhile to keep our self-respect, he claimed. Well, the riverfront got a lot better after 1920, but it didn't really shine until 90 years later when the Scioto Mile project was finally completed to much applause. Finally, Columbus got an enjoyable way to experience the riverfront, one of the largest of America's cities not on a navigable river. But finally, that city beautiful movement started by famed architect Daniel Burnham in the 1908 plan finally got realized 100 years later as the riverfront has now evolved into a space for everyone. Even if most Americans can't name the river that we are situated on, and what does Scioto River actually mean? In fact, Scioto is an American Indian word meaning deer. Indians and Ohio's early white settlers used the Scioto River for transportation. Water travel was much quicker and cheaper than land travel during this era, but the amount of deer in central Ohio was so large that every spring the river was coated with a thin layer of deer fur. So the name Scioto comes from the Shawnee American Indian word for hairy water because the Shawnee Indians found so much hair floating in the river after migrating from the Carolinas. Hence, artist Terry Allen 
did sculptures of three deer along the riverfront as probably the most iconic public art project in the modern era for Columbus paying homage to the large deer population of our region. But returning to our inferiority complex as this common theme in Columbus, here's a 1911 Columbus Dispatch cartoon that shows Mr. Columbus is in need of a makeover as he dreams of being more like better known cities. With a landscape architect to the right is designing him a new suit, the man to the left is showing off the latest styles of municipal clothing. Mr. Columbus is dreaming of the day where he could look as chic as Cleveland, Baltimore, or even Detroit. Fast forward 67 years, and a 1978 Columbus Monthly cover poses the same question about our inferiority complex. But this time the models are wearing a bit less clothing and the cities we feel inferior to have changed. Long gone is our inferiority to nearby industrial cities. Here we feel inferior to Houston, Atlanta, and Denver as the 98 pound weakling. Does Columbus still feel inferior 43 years after this cover story? Has the cities changed once again? Is it now Charlotte and Austin and Portland that we now feel inferior to? to? And while we do have many accomplishments and history to ground us, let's keep going with some of those interesting facts. So the P.W. Huntington Company Bank opened for business in 1866 at the corner of Broad and High. The four-story building you see on the corner with the turret is the corner where 160 years ago, Huntington Bank now still sits, but it's where they started. It was said on many mornings that Pal Palataya Huntington, the founder, picked up small sticks on the way to work to put into the stove to heat his office. And while this may just be an illustration of his thrifty nature, he was also the son of a banker and a descendant of the signer of the US Constitution. He actually went from being a messenger of the bank to the board of directors. And Huntington Bank continues to be one of the largest banks in our region today. And a large celebration dedicated Memorial Hall in 1906. At the time, this was the nation's second largest auditorium in seating capacity. And it was also built to honor Civil War veterans. It was so long in coming that it actually also honored the veterans of the Spanish-American War. After Veterans Memorial was built in the 1950s on West Broad Street at the riverfront, this building became the home of COSI for several decades. And then today it houses the offices for Franklin County. The city hall that we now know on the riverfront was not the original city hall for our city. This was Columbus's city hall prior to 1921, and it was located on East State Street, right across from the State House where the Ohio Theater sits today. The building was often referred to as a quote, monstrosity of Victorian architecture by those who hated what was called bric-a-brac and did not appreciate the building's oddities. After a spectacular fire, City Hall relocated to the prominent site at Civic Center Drive and Broad Street that we now know today. And it cleared the path for the Ohio Theater to be built. The Columbus Dispatch has always been a huge supporter for the increased annexation of our city. In doing so, the Dispatch believed that the growth of the city would increase the power of the newspaper's influence on the public agenda. They were setting in motion a policy of annexation that for many decades later, Mayor Sensenbrenner took to new levels, creating our current city of more than 220 square miles, larger in land area than Cleveland, Cincinnati, and Akron combined. Originally called the American Insurance Union Citadel, the Levesque Tower was the tallest building between New York and Chicago at the time of its opening in the late 1920s. This picture in 1926 shows how significantly out of scale the tower was compared to the rest of Columbus at that time. The building put our city skyline on the map and at 555 feet and five inches, the building is five inches taller than the Washington Monument, which was used as a marketing gimmick to attract office tenants to what was the largest office building in our region. Here we have the Dr. Samuel Hartman building. Once the richest man in Columbus, he derived his fortune from a cure-all tonic named per Knock, Claiming he received the formula in a dream from Native Americans, Peruna, 
was the most successful selling patent medicine in the world in 1887. But sales began to fall after the Food and Drug Administration was created in 1906, and they forced the good doctor to disclose his product's ingredients. Essentially, it was high proof alcohol. The building at Rich and Third Streets was demolished in the 1970s. But by the time his empire was collapsing, Dr. Hartman had an office building, an acoustically perfect theater, two hotels, a surgical hospital, and a palatial home on East Town Street clad in marble to display his wealth. For all that he owned, the only thing that now remains is the Hartman Building on North 4th Street, recently converted into condominiums. And so the state house we know has been in the works since 1837 to replace the, the original one uh, that used to actually be on the opposite corner of State and High. The work on the state house would start and stop in bits of appropriation with financial constraints. But for generations of citizens, they grew up looking at tall and ugly board fence built to keep the construction workers, inmates from the Ohio Penitentiary from escaping. For those who didn't think we needed such a large state house, somewhat of a miracle occurred for that group. In February of 1852, just as many people were arguing that Ohio only needed a small building for record storage, the old state house burnings built, burned to the ground. It finally provided the impetus for the House and Senate, which were renting halls to finally appropriate funds to finish the building after 24 years of construction. Another significant building in Columbus's architectural past is the Ohio State Armory and Gymnasium. It was destroyed by fire in 1958. This castle-like building had been the logical conclusion for a major OSU problem. In the late 1890s, student groups formed their own athletic associations and they constantly overspent. Rather than someday being embarrassed by scandal, the university founded an athletic association and built the armory. Students finally had a place for physical and military training and at, as was ex expected from a large land grant university. The site stood empty for 25 years after the fire and it is now the location of the Wexner Center for the Arts. Some of the design elements of the armory can certainly be seen in the Wexner Center of today, designed by internationally renowned architect, Peter Eisenman. Famous English suffragette Sylvia Pankhurst came to the city to speak in favor of women's suffrage in 1911 at the Memorial Hall on East Broad Street. Many well-known and educated women of Columbus believed voting was intended to be one vote per family as little moral compass of each family unsullied by the dirt of the political arena, the woman would be looked at by her husband for moral guidance. After seeking her view, it was believed the man would vote his wife's advice. It was Mrs. John Battelle who ran her family just as forcefully as she set the course of the Battelle Memorial Institute to honor her husband and her son. Mrs. B, as she was known, was not buying into this, nor kidding herself that a husband would listen to the opinion of his wife. She supported suffrage and women's suffrage, that is for white women, came to Columbus several years before it did on the national stage. And it was Columbus City Council that also adopted a resolution granting women the right to vote in municipal elections in 1917. This is a Columbus Dispatch cartoon that endorsed the right to vote. Quote, it is an outrage to deny women equal rights with men while we make them carry men's burdens. When their husbands are dead or are drunkards or are in jail, the women support the children and do it bravely and efficiently. They pay taxes for the support of a government in which they have no voice. Look over the graduating class in the nearest high school and see if there are not two girls for every boy the dispatch wrote as part of their strong endorsement for the right to vote. In 1907, one of Columbus's best known citizens was dying of pneumonia and it was Reverend James Poindexter. Born in Richmond, Virginia, he came to Columbus at age 19 and was a barber and pastor at Second Baptist Church for 59 years. He was well known to the public and to politicians of his day, serving 
as a member of the Columbus Board of Education and as the Columbus City Councilman, a trustee for the State School of the Blind, a trustee for Wilberforce University, and an advocate for African-American interests for President Hayes, President McKinley, and Governor Dennison. He was perhaps the only African-American who by 1907 had ever served on a jury in the state of Ohio. His abhorrence of slavery and desire for social justice was well known. And you can read more about his service at the Social Justice Park, now located at the corner of Broad and Grant downtown. But it was Poindexter Village, one of the first housing projects in the United States, was dedicated to his memory in 1940. President Franklin D. Roosevelt came to Columbus to do the honors. This now obsolete project has been recently redeveloped by the Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority as a mixed income community called Legacy Village. As we have come to recognize, large projects like this did not always work out. Luckily, one of the buildings has been preserved and is being turned into a museum to not only honor Reverend Poindexter's life, but the role of history projects like this and the Black community have played on the Near East Side. Another uh, leader of color, 1971 picture of Columbus folk artist, barber and teller of biblical tales carved in wood and mentor of the next generation of artists is none other than Elijah Pierce. He received national and worldwide attention when New York City's Museum of Modern Art featured his wood carvings. His barber shop was dismantled when Columbus State Community College constructed a parking garage on East Long Street. There is a historical marker along East Long Street honoring the role his barbershop played in community life for the Near East Side. Here we have a big bear store in 1934. It was actually the nation's first grocery self-serve supermarket. It was opened in a former roller rink on West Lane Avenue, right where River Watch Tower is at Lane Avenue and the river where the Lane Avenue Bridge is located. This elliptical structure prior to being a roller rink had actually been the Crystal Slipper nightclub and was once also used as a stable for polo ponies at Ohio State. But the real activity for this big bear, they actually kept a live bear in a cage to attract shoppers and children, but it was actually the real show was always inside because as a former roller rink with a slightly banked floor, the dance of the shopping carts was a major attraction. If left unattended for even a moment, hundreds of shopping carts would just roll around the store knocking into each other. And it was quite a spectacle that created a lot of laughs and smiles on people as they'd watch their carts take a life of their own. Here we have Central High School, now COSI. In events on February 25th, 1971, led to a major United States Supreme Court case decision. From January through March of that year, there was unrest in many American high schools, including Columbus City Schools High School and junior high schools about the Vietnam War and civil rights issues. 10 students at Marion Franklin High School were suspended for 10 days each for disobedient conduct following assembly. As per district policy, an expulsion from school required a hearing um, as a suspension did not. A few weeks before civil rights protests by African-American students began when Central High School administration canceled a student organized Black History Week assembly when it did not agree with the student's choice of speakers. The next day, there was widespread demonstrations at many schools. Two students were suspended. Neither had a hearing. On the basis of a violation of the 14th Amendment to the US Constitution, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the students. The Due Process Clause forbade arbitrary deprivation of liberty, and the case has now become a national landmark in student rights legislation. In 1920, the new name of a hospital operated by Dr. Method and Dr. Tribbett was announced the Alpha Hospital. The committee met at the YMCA and after a careful review of names suggested by several competition for the prize, Mrs. Charles Chavis's suggestion was selected. The name was most appropriate with Alpha meaning first. 
the hospital was the first African American hospital in Columbus. And though African American physicians could work in other hospitals, they were not permitted to work on an equal basis with white doctors, hence the Alpha Hospital was created out of the Young Men's Christian Association. Now we return to the Great Flood. It was at 9 a.m. on 1913, Columbus's greatest disaster began when frozen ground and unprecedented rain combined with earthen levees broke, sending 30 feet of water into Franklinton and Westside neighborhoods. Houses were knocked off foundations and 93 lives were lost. The river flooded 11 times before 1913, yet no one was prepared for the 100 year flood event. The east side of Columbus, while never in danger, through many residents did panic with someone at the Neal House Hotel on High Street yelling, the dam's busted. A James Thurber short story called The Day the Dam Broke was written 20 years after the tragedy. He estimated it would have taken 95 feet of water to flood High Street on the east side. But in his imagined story, the people fleeing the rumored flood on the east side of Columbus grew more frantic when someone yelled, go east. The crowd included housewives, dogs, cats, and his own mother carrying eggs and bread, office workers, and children on skates. One driver even drove all the way to Reynoldsburg trying to avoid the flood of the Scioto River, which never even reached High Street. Secretly, Columbus has periodically suffered from Cleveland envy over the years. But it was in 1908 when Columbus could be smug. Not only did the city's first skyscraper get erected, the Wyandotte, which still sits at the corner of Broad and High, but Columbus also snagged the famous architect yet again, Daniel Burnham, who designed Cleveland's Society for Savings Bank to do the job. And to make Columbus even smuggier against Cleveland, Burnham also designed Columbus's third Union Station that we recently talked about was demolished in 1976. Fortunately, this skyscraper has been preserved a skyscraper, by the way, is a building of 12 stories or taller. The Columbus Metropolitan Library on Grand Street was dedicated in 1907. It was made possible by a gift of $200,000 from industrialist Andrew Carnegie. Columbus was actually one of the last Carnegie-funded libraries in the country, and its popularity believed that Carnegie was moved to fund one more library after meeting John Pugh. John Pugh is a Columbus librarian. And after the two of them poured over maps of Columbus and its growing population, uh, Carnegie agreed to fund a brick library. And though Pew delightedly reported back to city officials, they asked him to return to Carnegie and ask for a marble library. Instead of labeling Columbus as ingrate, Carnegie was said to be pleased with the fact that Columbus requested a much more grand library to show the importance of learning and the importance of books to the public access. In 1918, there was a lot of Columbus backlash to Germans due to World War I. German textbooks were symbolically burned at Braden High in protest of the foreign policy actions of Kaiser Wilhelm I. Germans ceased to be used in Columbus public and parochial schools. 14,000 students who were studying the language stopped learning their German grammar. And since the uh, late 19th century, four schools in Columbus had taught all subjects exclusively in German, and the Ohio legislature published all Ohio proceedings in both English and German versions. The book burning was, of course, political theater. Like renaming Frankfurters as hot dogs and sauerkraut as liberty cabbage, most of Columbus had German roots. City council did its own political theater, changing some street and place names Schiller Park became Washington Park. Whitt uh, Whittier was named rather than Schiller Street, thereby trading in one poet's name for another. But most of city council was also German American. By the 1920s, Schiller Park was renamed its original name and the schools were teaching German, although now as an elective. But many of the German named streets in German village were never changed back. In 1929, with the gift from Mary Griswold, the YWCA was able to build the building we now know on South Fork Street, right behind the PNC Tower. Ever since its inception in 1886, 
the YWCA worked to empower women and eliminate racism. It has housed young women when needed, provided for emancipated teens not ready to go out into the world alone, housed relocated Japanese women in 1945, signed charters and petitions to support anti-racism and supported the ERA amendment in Ohio and beyond. The YWCA has had a history of fighting racism in Columbus and beyond. Columbus was historically not a union town because of its abundance of free labor from the prisoners at the Ohio State Penitentiary, now the site of the Arena District. Employers looked for such cheap labor. In only one of many examples, a new glove and mitten factory owned by the A.T. Hollock Company opened in 1899 just outside the prison walls. The operation employed 60 women and children with the other necessary labor for the factory it owned inside the prison walls. It produced 10,000 pairs of gloves a day. The leather and linings were cut out and fitted together in the penitentiary, and the sewing was done by women and children outside the plant. However, within a few years, Halleck's practices were getting challenged, not by labor unions and not by social justice advocates, but by other companies that wanted a similar sweetheart deal for their industry. Prison labor was a political plum within the prerogative of the governor of the state. The controversy over for-profit companies using prison labor continues to this day as a social justice issue, but had been rooted in the Ohio Penitentiary more than 130 years ago. The first meeting of the Ohio Agricultural and Mechanical College was held in the office of Governor Ruther B. Hayes in 1870, and the stage was set for the future Ohio State University with the establishment of a land grant signed by President Lincoln on July 2nd, 1862. After looking at many sites for the location of the new university, the trustees finalized their decision to buy William Neal's farm of 331 acres for $117,000. It was decided to purchase this, film, this farm specifically because of a sweet artisanal spring waters now known as Mirror Lake. After testing the water, one German trustee excluded, quote, it's hard to get a Dutchman away from a spring like that. And Columbus residents started to come from miles away to take water home from this spring because of how sweet it tasted. But it was in 1931 when the Ohio State University class of 1927, 29, and 1930 announced plans to convert Mirror Lake's old spring into an artistic rock garden. The spring once supplied artisanal water and many came to fill those containers. It was considered to be that major factor for the board to pick the university. But in the 1890s, the city of Columbus accidentally punctured the source of the water and the natural spring went dry. Ever since the lake has been supplied by other water sources uh, to, and a fountain was installed to keep the water moving. No longer spring water, but obviously the fountain still operates today in Mirror Lake to keep the lake clean. One of the earliest responses to racism in Columbus included organized and unorganized protests. However, it was in August of 1921, the Bud Dairy Company on North 4th Street, an Italian village, advertised its new dairy-based soft drink in the Ohio edition of the KKK newspaper, The Fiery Cross. The Klan was planning a major convention at the fairgrounds and the Bud family spotted an opportunity to increase its market share. However, Italian Village and Wyland Park were mixed use neighborhoods and the day after African Americans started to cancel their milk orders in mass. Defense from the Bud Dairy that they were not racist fell on deaf ears and after seven months, the Bud family was forced to sell. The action is thought to be the earliest successful racially based economic boycotts in the United States. Bud Dairy just opened in spring of this year as a new uh, food hall. And here we have one of our most iconic buildings, the Franklin Park Conservatory, which was originally part of the 1893 Columbian Exhibition in Chicago. The building was disassembled and brought to Columbus to be part of Franklin Park, but it was not yet Franklin Park. It was actually the Ohio State Fairgrounds. It is one of just a handful of buildings that remains to this day from the 1893 exhibition which was also known as the White City for its beautiful, although temporary buildings. 
Speaking of white buildings, in 1934, a customer could go to many locations to enjoy White Castle. Employees had to read a 16-page employee manual. There were 31 points about how to dress, 19 points on how to treat a hamburger, 12 points on the bun, and more on floors, onions, coffee, pickles, and even salt and pepper. Columbus has been home to White Castle since, and this year they're celebrating their century in business, as the company was one of the first fast food pioneers priding itself on quality, affordability, and especially cleanliness. And this is why the Ingram family chose to do the buildings in white brick and white enamel. Excited residents poured into Columbus's most famous downtown intersection, Broad and High, in 1945 to celebrate the end of World War II. This was in contrast to the celebration that marked the end of World War I when thousands crowded downtown but arrived days early because of rumors of peace and had to return three, day later, three days later when the war actually officially ended on August 14, 1945. They arrived in mass on the right day. And here we have one of the most ambitious buildings to be built in Columbus announced in 1953. The Temple of Goodwill, designed to be the Protestant denomination of the United States headquarters. It would have been much taller than the Lebec Tower. The purchase site covered two city blocks facing the Soda River between West Long and West Spring Streets. Construction would start for a hotel, broadcast facilities, and office space. However, by 1968, the Ohio Council of Churches voted against making Columbus its international headquarters. The tower would be one of many proposed, never built. It is now the site of AEP. It was not enough that the Lazarus family gave Columbus the most amazing department store emporium for over 100 years. The no hassle, one price deals, signing cana singing canaries in every department in 1909, a ladies room and place to lay down with an attendant on duty, a return policy that included taking back things that had never been sold at Lazarus were all just many examples of its great service. However, Thanksgiving was a holiday since Lincoln's time. The last Thursday in November was sometimes the fourth Thursday and sometimes the fifth Thursday. If the dates were fixed to the fourth Thursday, Fred Lazarus reasoned that customers would not be cheated out of shopping days before Christmas. He lobbied President Roosevelt and Lazarus single-handedly stabilized the Thanksgiving date in 1941. However, it was not without cost because the first year of the new national holiday was a nightmare on tra train tables and the football games, including the Ohio State Michigan game. But the date for Black Friday was actually born in Columbus. Getting to all those shoppers downtown needed traffic improvements. A new downtown plan turned 3rd Street and 4th Street into one-way pairs. In fact, this was done as a 90-day trial in 1950. However, City Council never acted to make these one-way pairs permanent pairs. It was also done as cost savings during the war and also to more efficiently move people in and out of the city in case of national attack. Obviously, the 90-day trial is still in effect 70 years later. And interestingly enough, four days after they were converted to one-way pairs, the traffic congestion returned. It was actually the plan for 270 was originally designed in 1956. And the northern arc of 270 was planned to actually be much further south between Morse and 161. Fortunately, it was moved further north as the city continued to grow but it took 21 years to open the 55 mile loop. Here we have a scene of 270 at Route 23 in Worthington in 1975. Many Columbus residents who lived within the heart of the city with no thought as to how much gas would be used to travel the loop got into their cars to drive the entire distance to look at the city. In fact, when 270 finally opened, it was called the highway to nowhere because it was so void of any traffic. As we look toward Pride Month, a year after Stonewall Union of Columbus was founded, the city held its first gay pride parade in 1982 with over 1,000 people participating in the march up North High Street. The parade marked the 13th anniversary of the police raid on Stonewall Union in New York City's Greenwich Village. Many point to the raid as the beginning of the gay pride movement. Here we have the very first one in June of 1982, heading southbound on Front Street, about 500 marchers. It was the first official parade 
but Columbus is now reported to have one of the largest pride celebrations in the United States. However, COVID has canceled the past two, including what would have been a massive parade this month. As we wrap up into modern history, I now want to move into an era that shows this 1980 Columbus Monthly lead story called Cops Under Fire, which focuses on the death of young black males in the custody of police and the challenges the police face with community support. It also references a previous report by the Columbus Bar Association that said, quote, a psychology within the department that tries to create fear in the minds of lowly and defenseless citizens. It was a report by the Columbus Bar Association in 1949, identifying the struggles the Columbus Police Department have with community relations. As we look to the future, Columbus is a growing city with a bright future. With projects like this that grab our attention, or projects like this now under construction behind COSI, or projects like this in suburban Columbus, which are the scale and size of which we've never seen before. But growth and prosperity are not the same thing. As we look to the future, it's important to reflect on our past. The prosperity of our region is not guaranteed. We are growing, but too many in our region lack access to quality education and employment that provides income to meet expenses. It is an emotional connection to place and knowing our past that I believe will create a city where we're willing to fight for the future. I hope that you learned some things about Columbus today. I hope that you have a newfound love of the city and that you will be willing to fight to make our city better for all. I wanna thank you for joining us this afternoon. I hope this event has encouraged you to explore more of the opportunities within Central Ohio and our neighborhoods. And for more information about additional programming, please visit the United Way of Central Ohio website at liveunitedcentralohio.org events. Thank you all and have a great day.